because of, because of that long life in the area, I also had a, a really, uh, how do I put this? A lot of my outlook on life, a lot of my outlook on art was framed in my relationship with, with Shreveport and with people here. And so if you, if you go this way through here, uh, Don Weta was a really important influence on me. And it's because he, as president here, was so open to conversation with uh, the kids who went to the school. So my very first time to eat in the cafeteria, I sat down to this little guy almost Lilliputian looking, and it turned out he was the president of the college. <laughs> and our first, our first conversation was about, uh, was about grits. And he was fascinated with the idea of grits. And um, before a month was out, he had the entire, uh, you know, upper management of the college sitting up there in their, in their academic regalia for, at, on a platform at high table for the eating of the first grit, <laughs> where he ceremonially had grits for the first time. Uh, but he was also, you know, he is also, and it's amazing that, uh, that he's still spry at this time, he, he's also so, sharp and, and witty and intelligent and, and when, when I was doing the sketches for this piece, we were talking about what was then going on uh, with the IRA in Northern Ireland and in England, a series of bombings that had been like a crescendo over the last several months. And I could not, as a Southerner, understand, because I've been raised to think that what we as Southerners saw was, we saw differences because of the color of somebody's skin or something like that. And, and at least there you've got what sounds like a, a marker that you could take to be not irrational. But I, I couldn't understand why people who were genetically identical as populations would look at each other in the same way. And, and he was, uh, he, his experience, which had included uh, being in, a, in a, a command officer on a Royal Navy destroyer, was that, you know, he could see in these people that they wore their they wore their cultural and belief differences on the outside. That he said that uh, uh, an Irish Protestant can tell an Irish Catholic a mile away because you know we do we wear we wear our cultural accoutrements on the outside of us, and that's the thing that separates us as much as anything else. So you know and. and so when I'm thinking in terms of how you, how you tell a story in imagery, there's this subtlety about how you tell these stories in imagery. And that was, that was a, a really deep bit of thought that he gave me. Uh, Hank Storr, who painted this painting, was, I, I, I've always, I, I was telling a student today uh, about my observation from teaching that um, there seemed to be a strong affinity in the medical field for art. So that about half the students that I taught when I was at the Barnwell uh, were medical professionals of one form or another, doctors or nurses or such. And one of these, I was telling my mother one day, was a man named Hank Storr. And she, that Hank Storr had been her boss when she worked at what was then Confederate Memorial Hospital. Uh, he was the lead pathologist there. 
So that was one of the, a, a circle of interest. He came back and uh, he loved vibrant colors. He wanted everything to be really bright colors, much brighter than I painted, but so he, he had his own ideas and he went with those ideas and I think he did a great job with this. I tell the story here of, of Kathy Trogel, who I also taught at the Barnwell. I can, it, it's, it's very difficult for me to tell this story without crying because uh, her mother came to me and you know, I, I encourage you to read these stories because they're important to you. But her mother came to me saying that uh, Kathy, if she had been capable of taking her own life, would have done so, but she was a quadriplegic because of an auto accident that had happened about six years before we, we met. And so she wanted to bring her daughter in and, and she literally asked me to save her daughter's life. So what, after a couple of weeks of, you know, trying to be encouraging and sticking a brush in my teeth and stuff like that, I, I uh, was almost in despair before the third session of the class that she was in because I, I didn't think I had done anything like a good job for her. And I decided that the way to do this was to just Ex, you know, live as she was having to live. So I had the I had the other students tie me into a chair with my hands behind my back, and we set up uh, a little station for brushes and such. And and then I painted two little, very simple paintings. And. For three hours, I was living as she lived, not able to, to move. I was tied to the chair so that I couldn't move my torso or anything like that. And that seemed to make the difference for Kathy. And she, she really got serious about painting. And you can see the difference in the quality of these two paintings right here. This one. Uh, was painted about three years after I taught her. And this one was painted about three years after that. Now, mind you, she's painting these paintings with a brush held in her teeth because that's all, that's the only way she can do it. But at the same time, she was also completing uh, her degree in psychology and she completed a master's in psychology and became a professional psychologist, I think at Willis Knighton Hospital. And uh, she, she really ran with the idea of being uh, a successful person despite the fact that those things that we, we take to be all important were not available to her. Uh, Milton Fletcher, here. I love Milton Fletcher. Uh, he was hard to talk to, and I think that was mostly caution on his part. Uh, the, the culture in Shreveport in the, in the late 70s and early 80s was, was still a very difficult thing for, for blacks to, to negotiate. The, the uh, custodial staff at the Barnwell all called me Mr. Lee, which I found really embarrassing because I'm, I'm talking to people in their uh, 50s and 60s, and they're addressing me like, you know, like I'm some judge or something. Uh, and there I was in my early 20s. But uh, I really loved to be around Milton because he's he's got such a sense of narrative in his paintings. He's telling. He's always telling stories about something. So uh, Mr. Cooper told me, don't you ever teach him anything? <laughs> because they were afraid that, it, that he would try to run with that and maybe get overly sophisticated. He was, he was selling very well as a, what we were calling at the time a primitive. Uh, and, and he used that, the proceeds from that to travel all over the world. He even 
uh, did one painting that was, you know, a, a tour through Buckingham Palace because he had gone to Buckingham Palace and then in a big crystal room he met the Queen and he shook her hand. <laughs> I thought, what a, what a step, what a step. So uh, I loved him and, and I did a picture of him in the, uh, in the mirror that we used for doing watercolor demonstrations. Now, one of the things about, about the influence of other people from the Shreveport area is that you, know, you, you get these things and they kind of stick in your mind and they become something that grows up out of this, you know, this little kernel that gets planted. Uh, Clyde Connell was one of those people. Her, her sculptor, the sculptures would, they were often totemic objects like these. And uh, there were, was a particular set that uh, was made of sticks and paper mache and, and mud and stuff like that. And she would create these little rooms inside it. And inside the space in that room, she put something like, a, you know, a, say a smooth stone or something. And that that always got me because there was this there was this captive space, and something very precious was in there. And I I was playing with that idea. So you'll see references that all of those all of those paintings that you see around the room that were done originally in the watercolor mirror are the children of that idea in a two-dimensional form. So this this piece, uh, my wife tells me we sold it, we didn't lose it, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, it was it was called something before. So you know. I've, there, the idea was that I captured the, the shadow of a previous event. Uh, over there, I was just enshrining myself in one. Uh, but on this one, th that, was, that was me giving Milton that same kind of, of enshrined place that I think of in, in uh, Clyde Connell's pieces. Now, as we go around this way, you see the influence of uh, Jean Becajol. Now, because I was working here, and, and literally every day, I was coming in, and at the time, there were usually, almost all of the first floor was given over to Becajol's paintings. So I would get the chance to go through and see these, these wonderful works of his uh, done during a tour of French Indochina. And it was, it was very intimidating, but it was also, it was also like a, uh, like a challenge, you know, something waving a finger in my face saying, you try this. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I would study how he did things and I, study how he, he worked, because he obviously had to work very fast. He was, he was in the region for less than two years and came out with 350 works. Not all of them paintings, but a large number of them were paintings. And so the, the paintings that you see of his are there from that uh, time period are extremely fresh and and lively even though he's a very very classical painter and I, I always liked that about him I couldn't I couldn't spend the time to do very classical paintings because Mr. Cooper wanted me to have 50 paintings and I had two years to do this 50 paintings for my uh, senior show so it was I had to I had to produce, 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 and that made an impressionist out of me. <laughs> but, uh, so, 
Dave Bajol was, was a constant influence and challenge to me. And being exposed to him literally every day was an important part of my education. Now, is, this is kind of out of order in that we're sort of going backwards in time, but Don Brown, Don Brown's all over the, this place. Don Brown is all over the influence of the art department. He established the art department at Centenary College. Uh, he was an artist of great interest. He was also someone who, who loved the ordinary. And, you know, I've, I've tried to wrap my mind around that because among artists, that's not, that's not a typical way of seeing the world. And it was after I thought about, it was after I thought about how uh, Willard Cooper also was someone who loved the ordinary that I began to think in terms of what I knew about Don Brown. Uh, because be, thanks to uh, uh, Light and Vicki Cummins here, I found out that he had been a, a gun captain in World War II, in World War I, in World War I. And that, that was, that helped to cement his relationship with Jean Dabajol, which is one of the reasons that Dabajol was here, and one of the reasons why Dekichol's collection of art wound up here, and it's because of that collection of art winding up here that we've got this building as a museum today, because that was what Oliver Meadows gave the money to house. So, if y'all want to say more about this, this would, you know, that would be a great opportunity to, but, these people are real experts on Don Brown. <laughs> but as, as we were putting the show together, I, I wanted to make sure that people understood the debt I owe to Don Brown, uh, in part because Willard Cooper kept telling stories about Don Brown. Over and over, you'd hear about how he how he went this place or that place on this paddle wheeler that he built himself with his own two hands. Uh, the story, one of the stories that I love was he talked, uh, uh, Willard talked about uh, Don, li Don Brown liked to uh, cook and he would multitask. So he liked to cook things by setting, he'd set the can of whatever it was on the exhaust, you know, it's a, it was powered by a Model T engine. So it's, it's this little four cylinder engine and the exhaust ports come out the side and they have a little platform. So he would set <coughs> cans of whatever he wanted to cook on the, on the little platform and then he'd go back to, to uh, steering the boat. One day he forgot to open one of those cans and it was tomato soup. <laughs> and it wound up all over the inside of the engine room. <laughs> and, but he'd also talk about, about Brown just making his way down the bayous with the cypresses hanging over and doing a painting or drawing of <clears throat> alligators or egrets or whatever, or whatever it was that he saw that he wanted to, to touch on. And so you see that in, in his work. And these, the, these little prints and things like that were, they were not literally all over the art department, but there were enough of them that you couldn't go to the art department without seeing one or two of them. So that, that was also a daily influence on me. And, and when I started thinking about how you paint East Texas, it had not occurred to me how much of East Texas is wetland and how much is cypress forested rather than just pine forested. 
And as I got deeper and deeper into that, I just kept, I kept seeing the echoes of what I had seen in Don Brown's work. And I realized that I was, uh, I was retracing his steps <clears throat> in a lot of ways. So this, uh, this painting is of a courthouse lawn. And you'll notice if you take a close look that the statue on this uh, Confederate soldier memorial is the same as the statue up there on that one. And these are two different courthouses and obviously two different artists. But I didn't know that Don had done that. As we, you know, as we make our way around, you've got uh, you've got more of these kinds of things. One thing about um, one thing that's interesting about being what a regionalist painter is that I believe that regionalism is a form of journalism. And in journalism, what you do, you know, you're, you're trying to record something for, for people who didn't experience it. And these things like this are also a record, and they're, they wind up being a cultural record, even if they're, even if they're records of, uh, say, machinery or technology or something like that. And one of my fascinations is uh, changes in technology over time. So we have near my home and uh, our, our home in Dodge, there's a turning bridge that can be turned by a single person doing a hand crank. And the railroad bridge that crosses the Red River downtown has a platform from which someone could do that. So they could actually turn that bridge to allow river traffic to go by on the Red River as well. And I had, I had been using that bridge when I was teaching at the Barnwell uh, in explaining positive and negative space in drawing and painting. But these are, these are things that are fascinating to me because they're, they're marking transitions in the culture and in our, uh, uh, in the way that we deal with technological issues and, and problems. And so these, these bridges were being built largely to try to keep a form of transportation going that was dying for economic reasons. So they're spending much more money to build a bridge than they would have spent <laughs> if they just built it you know, to allow the train traffic to go by, and that would have, in the long run, been a little better because it was the railroads and not the lack of uh, ability to go on the rivers that was killing the steamboats. This, too, is uh, you know, an instance a kind of material culture thing. This, uh, I call this piece in the hope of the resurrection. And in East Texas, logging has been a, a major industry for virtually the entire time uh, people have been living there. And in my, in my text in the book, I talk about this in terms of farming because Although it happens intergenerationally sometimes, you may be able to grow two, uh, two harvests of pine trees in a lifetime. It's most likely that you'll grow one <laughs> if you're actually growing it. But it, otherwise, it is just like farming. Even though it doesn't happen in a single growing season, People plant, people nurture their fields, people uh, wait for the, for the crop to ripen, and then they, they come and take the harvest. And so to me, that's a, it's, it's really a, a marvelous piece of, again, the ordinariness that uh, 
Willard and Don Brown so much liked. Now I was, I was talking about ordinariness and how these two men thought in, you know, how, how they could be so in love with the ordinary things. And I think it comes out of that experience of, of being warriors. Uh, Willard Cooper flew uh, cargo missions over the hump in, uh, across the Himalayas from India to China during World War II. And when he got finished with that, he wanted, he wanted to be able to live the life he wanted as opposed to you know, getting down to doing something that someone else had prescribed for him. So he became an artist, which was not something that I think was in his family or anything. Don Brown, too, had been in World War I as a gun captain, as I said earlier. And, <coughs> and when, he was, when he was finished with that, I think he, he wanted to be someone who could lift up what it is, you know, you've had extraordinary experiences, but ordinary exp experiences, ordinary lives are also significant lives. And they, they make these great contributions to the, the common culture we all have. And those two men love this, this ordinary culture. And lifting up the, you know, the, the backsides of Shreveport, like uh, Willard so often did, or you know, the, the undersides of railroad bridges and, and things like that. And of course, Don Brown is just showing you ordinary, you know, the things that you see all the time, but he's showing them to you because you don't see them all the time because they're there all the time for you to take, take them for granted. And uh, so, you know, as I thought more and more about that, I began to realize that I had, I had caught some of that from the two of them. And, and I, that's, that's what I love about East Texas. I did the book because we, we do not, we, we're not paying attention to the ordinary things that are all around us that are so full of meaning. And East Texas and frankly, Louisiana uh, are, are places where there's all this uh, there's all this cultural content all around us. We're, we are full to brimming with people living together, working, trying to be productive together, and they are, they're not being, you know, super extraordinary or, or uh, famous or, or anything like that, and so we overlook them. But these these ordinary things, the tractor sitting out in the field, the just looking back at a campus, having Christmas lights on your oil derricks, uh, having a diesel engine sitting out in a field because uh, 70 years ago somebody electrified the countryside. Those are, those are all parts of the ordinariness that is actually deeply significant if you sit back to think about it a little bit. And so the uh, in doing the in doing the book, one of the things that I really wanted to to get around to was letting people see <clears throat> how this ordinary stuff is all around us being really extraordinary, not, not being uh, insignificant because, they're, because it's stuff that you see every day, but being significant because it's stuff you see every day. So the, you know, the little country road with, a, with an old store there, that's, that's a precious thing because it's a fading thing, and it's part of the culture that 
framed who we are today, and we're losing that. And there's not really much you can do about losing it, except to, to try to, to give it a space where you celebrate it for what it was. And that's, so I, I think that having come to grips with that idea, you know, that the, the ordinary stuff is, it is valuable even though it doesn't seem to, to stand out. It's, it's something that I, I felt was necessary to say. And when I, when I made the, the offer uh, to Texas A&M University Press on this book, it was the only offer they had on a book about East Texas. They had 15 uh, proposals at the time for books on Central Texas and more yet in the west and more yet in the plains north and, and stuff like that. But people are not, they're not thinking about East Texas and frankly, you know, much of, much of rural, rural Louisiana uh, as being worthy of recording in art or worthy of recording in terms of culture. And I think there, there's something that we're uh, taking a profound risk of losing by not realizing how precious that ordinary thing is. And that's my talk. <laughs> Yes, yes. I answered every question you had. <laughs> Explain about painting watercolors in a mirror. Painting, okay, so you're not painting the watercolors in the mirror. What you're doing is you're using the mirror to hang over the top of you, kind of like uh, Snoopy over the, you know, in the Halloween episode. But you know, the mirror hangs over the top so that you can look over the artist's shoulder as they're painting. And that way you can get a top-down view because the, paint, the, the watercolor has to be painted flat or almost flat. And so it's very difficult for a, a group like this to see what's happening on the surface of the watercolor paint, as opposed to... It's, it's classroom paint. Yeah, it's a class, yeah. It's a classroom thing, but to me, I, I thought, man, you know, what a subject for art that is. To, you know, to have that thing and have those, have those little jewels trapped inside it like that. Yes? There's a lot of variation in the dimensions of your canvases and the size. Mm -hmm. How do you arrive at those proportions and those sizes? Is well, part of it is uh, thinking about how much time I want to spend on a given image. Uh, but part of it is also that some things really suggest themselves as needing you know, a, light, a nice wide canvas, uh, and, and other ones uh, maybe a square or, or something like that. So I, I think the relative dimensions are something that has to do with the image itself. And, and then if I want to do something that I'm not taking a great risk on, I, I need to be able to do it quickly. Like the, like the painting at the, at the corner there, uh, the first step, that was painted literally in an afternoon and so it's small for the, for the sake of being, of being quick. And if, uh, if I've got something that I think might be a, a risky image or, or one that, that, may not, that may not be as strong as I hope it'll be, then I'll usually do it kind of small first to see, well, is it, is it a viable image? And, and sometimes I'll take those and they, they look really good once they're painted and I'll go on and do a big one after that. 
I also noticed a lot of um, difference in your framing. Do you make those decisions? And Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually hate framing. I, I do. Uh, I, I don't like I don't like doing frames, and it's partly because one, it's just so darn expensive, and two, sometimes you you know you do something that's a kind of big gaudy frame, and it feels like an ego statement to me, and so for for things like that. Uh, I, I leave it. I like to leave it to others to frame the paintings. But there are some times that I'll do a, a frame specifically for a painting. I did. <clears throat> I did a commission uh, for a, for a ranching couple, couple in uh, West Texas, out near Fort Davis. And on their ranch, they have a cave that has uh, uh, Pecos River culture drawings in it. So you've got 4,000 year old drawings in this, in this place. And I thought, you know, that and the fact that I couldn't do all the beautiful vistas that I wanted. So I, I just made the frame an extension of the painting by putting more landscapes and then references to these, uh, to these Indian drawings on it. When you, when you first started painting, did you have a vision of what your career would be? And if so, did that change over the years as you, as you went or a little longer? I, I, was, I was talking to some students last night and I said, you know, I always go into something with a plan. And when I get into it, the plan doesn't work. And then I have to work, you know, and then I have to to negotiate with reality to get to where I've got something that functions. And that's, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a painting or if it's a, a mural or, or uh, doing a museum display or getting along with my wife. It's all right. <laughs> that, the, yes, I had a plan going in. I, I thought I knew what I was gonna do. And, and it didn't work out like that, and I'm all the better for it. You spoke some about your work as an art instructor at the Barnwell, which more recent reporters might just know as the local aquarium. Right. In the States. Right. Can you tell us some about your trajectory from centenary graduate to art instructor at the Barnwell? Uh, my my trajectory from one to the other was uh, I, I worked for about three weeks at the at a Sears calling center, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got a call from a friend who said that the instructor at the Barnwell was leaving, and they thought I might uh, apply for that job, and I did. And I got it. So <laughs> it was a short trajectory, <laughs> but thank God it got me out of that call center because I was dreadful at that time. <laughs> so is there a specific painting that you're just like really attached to? Or like it has like another meaning beyond like what you initially thought it would have? You know, uh, I think I think all of them have unexpected meanings. The, the one of the pier back over there. I, most people don't fall in love with that painting, but I, I love that painting. I, I think that's one of the nicest paintings I've done in a long time. And, and it's because the water in it works and the trees work and the foliage works and, the, and that here, sticking out there in the isolation is, is a nice psychological, it's, it's like you're, you're trying to understand what's going on with it. So, yeah, I, I really like that painting. I, I like the colors between the water. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, yeah, and, and <laughs> okay, so when, I'm gonna I'm gonna upset the cameraman for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but what what made this what made this 
really worked for me was this shadow right here. Because it, it creates the space that this tree is in. So, you know, this, this tree could be nothing if, the, if that shadow wasn't there to, to tell you where it existed in a three-dimensional space. And until, until the, the shadow is there, it's, it doesn't, even the water over here doesn't work all that well. But I keep thinking, wow, yeah, I meant to do that. <laughs> and, you know, I, I get it. They say that being skilled is getting lucky breaks a lot. And so, you know, so I've been making my luck there, but that was really... I don't think I fully understood how that was going to work, and uh, it, it did work very well. So um, I really like that thing. Yeah, but there, you know, each each one of them has a, has a different aspect to it. I, I also really like uh, the out to pasture over there, and. That's as much because of the psychological content of it. It's another one of those. It's another one of those uh, Clyde Connell moments where uh, you you've got this car, and inside that car there was a, a car seat, and it was exactly the kind of car seat my parents used to put my little brother in when when we were kids. You know, I'm the oldest of three, and so I was about five years older than he was. And and I thought, when I saw that, it, it just, it hit me like a bolt of lightning. And so there is, there's a, that's like a Clyde Connell sculpture, because it's got this kind of holy object contained inside. And if you know, if you know it's there, it's just, you know, it's deeply meaningful. And you know all the other stuff that goes with it is is uh, kind of storytelling to to give it a sense of place. Let's see others. I'm I'm told by the students that the uh, centenary nighttime series is one that a lot of them like, and uh, I can understand that. I was I was painting them as a student. I was a senior at the time, so you're you know you're you're seeing a, a very experimental process because I didn't try to eliminate the canvas or anything like that. I thought that would distort the colors that I was seeing. So I was just depending on my knowledge of how I laid out my palette to to guide me because I knew what paints were where and about how they would react with one another as I mixed them. And I could, I could see it just well enough to tell where things were going and, and all that sort of stuff. And I reasoned that I could fix it in the studio if something was really bad. Uh, and I didn't have to fix as much as I expected to. So that's, you know, that's another of those uh, as a as a series, I liked that series a lot. But you know, each one of them has has an aspect that, if I think about it, it's sort of like children. You know, which one is your favorite kid? <laughs> <laughs> and, and how guilty are you willing to feel <laughs> for, for thinking so? <laughs> but the. Uh, there's a reason. There's a reason I launched into painting each one of them, and that's you know the, that goes to the narratives in the book. But it's also uh, in in terms of how 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 you look back on them. Each one of them is uh, contains some part of a process, like in with my two bridge paintings up there on the top. For each of those, I went specifically to those locations and trudged around in the sand or the leaves or, or something. So I have, a, I have a very physical memory of what it was to get those, to get those paintings. And 
that you know that that happens a lot. So it's very difficult to say to give a favorite to say that oh this is my favorite painting ever. Uh, it's it's better I think to say I, I really love X aspect of this painting and that really you know that's a that's a really deep part of what's important to me. The, the Don Webb painting, that was really important to me because that, that was the first time I tried to do a, you know, something that was a psychological study of someone else. And the, uh, his, his environment that he had made for himself there spoke a lot to him. The, if you, the, the little, sign that's on the table to the left uh, said it had printed on it in big Roman uh, letters uh, as shoe obfuscation mm -hmm. <laughs> and he and I looked at that and he said do you know what that means I said uh, I think maybe I think I know what a shoe means and he explained to me <laughs> he explained to me that that was uh, don't don't speak in confusing ways. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know he he also had this you know uh, he he didn't quite revere Churchill, but he was very impressed with the man, and and so I wanted you know I wanted that that relationship between him and that statue of, of Churchill to stand out as well. So it, for each one, there was, there was something about it that was a driving factor in why that painting exists. And it's a little bit like the, you know, if you're, if you're, teaching, uh, if you're teaching storytelling or writing, or something like that, then the, the first thing that a, an author ought to know is why this, why this story they're trying to write should exist and why should anybody be interested in reading it. So for each painting, I've, you know, I've kind of had to do that for myself. There were times when I painted out of desperation and I produced a lot of, paint, of bad paintings that way. One thing that comes to mind, uh, and I'm becoming aware of the older I get, the more I think I can see in uh, something that, like you said, didn't look so ordinary before, that I, like that cypress tree root. You know, what did mm -hmm. it take to make that for us? Yeah. And yeah. That you can convey it to us, and we have it forever, no matter what happens to the old tree. Right. Right. So and it, I think the that, easier it is to soak things in. One of, one of the things that's underappreciated in art is that uh, for, in a, in a painting process, a painter is supposed to kind of lead the viewer along. But the viewer also contributes that the part of the journey. So for each viewer that journey will be different. No two people are going to go past the corner on, on the, uh, in hope of the resurrection back there in the same way. They'll all carry their own baggage into it. They'll all carry their own uh, preconceptions about what it is you're looking at. You know, that's, oh, that's just a terrible, messed up field. Or, you know, this is, some people will look at that and, and see a devastation. And when I'm, when I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it as someone who's lived among loggers for 30 years. And to them, that's the beginning of something. So, you know, over here I said, every beginning is the end of something. Well, that's a perfect example of that. That's, that's a beginning as much as it is an end.
I grew up in East Texas, and I really appreciated what you said about the ordinary. Because, you know, you do. It, there's just so many ordinary things that, is, as he said, as we get older, that they become more significant. And I, I really appreciate what you said. Well, and because, because we can take them for granted, uh, you you even you lose even the opportunity to appreciate it. You know they they fade around you and you're not really cognizant of the loss until something happens. And so the last image in the book is of a mural by Ansel Nunn that was in his studio. The studio had originally been the office of an iron foundry that was built alongside the railroad. Uh, this was the Houston and Great Northern Railroad that went from, from Houston up to Palestine. And so that, this sat alongside the tracks there. And what this foundry did at the time was put new tires on uh, railroad wheels. And so the building had been there for years and years and years, and none was the last person to actually rent it for a, for a useful purpose. And the owners wanted to raise his rent and charge him 10% uh, of receipts or something like that. And he said no, and he just left. And so the, his mural in there, which was uh, one of his coffee company murals, was just sitting there as the as the ceiling and roof fell in on it, and that that was uh, to me to get in there. <laughs> I, I, I joke a little bit, just a little bit, about it being a dangerous place to be <laughs> to take pictures so that I could go painting from. But it was that that's a, a perfect example of that kind of ordinariness, and it's there for us, and then it's not going to be there for us. 